What's up guys? I'm feeling a bit uh, a bit ropey this morning if I'm honest. Uh, all self-inflicted because I was up till probably I reckon 2am this morning. Uh, first of all getting lost in the Netflix Formula 1 series which I completed last night by the way and loved. Um, so that's the first thing. I'll talk about that in a moment. And then secondly I managed to do a bit more work on this book. I mentioned once before I've got a second book underway. It's been slow progress uh, with this second book. So difficult. Remember what it's like when you're at school trying to motivate yourself to do a, a kind of essay or your dissertation at uni. It feels like you've got forever, doesn't it, when you when you look at when it's got to be delivered. Very quickly that comes around and, uh, and progress has been much slower than I hoped it would be. So anyway, pleased to say I got on with some more of that last night. Um, and, I, and kind of once you get back into it, you really start to re-motivate yourself so that's good so that's underway and i'll continue that i'm sure over the next few days um but netflix documentary drive to survive the formula one doco uh, i watched it all and i've got to say overall i loved it i thought it's a really brilliant thing that they've done um i've touched on it a few times in some other videos but the fact that it gives you some behind the scenes access is what made it for me yes it was overproduced uh, yes it was over dramatized at times um, but the reality is, it was, uh, you know, done for a very specific reason, to try and entice people into the sport. And I suspect it's going to do exactly that. Because one of the things that, that I loved about this and frustrates me at times about some of the more mainstream coverage of our sport is that it's the biggest team sport in the world. You know, I was part of one of those teams. Uh, I have a, a kind of unique... Uh, insight a unique perspective on what happens within formula one what happens within a team and it's not a perspective that that most mainstream media uh, ever see fit to show um, or to talk about biggest team sport in the world and yet we hardly ever hear from the team and i thought that's what the netflix documentary addresses uh, not by specifically targeting particular team members but just by giving some behind the scenes access to the daily running of a team, what's going on inside the garage, little snippets of conversations between mechanics or between engineers, the, the kind of radio chatter that we don't always hear on the mainstream broadcasts, those kind of things. Just details that give you something different to what we're all used to. Uh, some kind of access or insight into the world of how these amazing Formula One teams operate. And that I loved. absolutely mental you can't bring that stick it's like twice as big as you come on this way wait come here <laughs> it's hilarious and he's insistent on bringing it <laughs> you nutters, absolute nutters. Um, yeah, so so that's my point. There were a couple of episodes uh, that I thought went, you know, way too far in terms of the dramatisation. Uh, I think it was the second to last episode focusing on the battle between Haas and Renault, um, particularly around the Austin Grand Prix last year and the battle for fourth in the championship. I know that's a big battle and it, it means a lot to those teams, so I get that that is a story and... Uh, <laughs> But it was 100% overplayed. Um, and even things like, things that, that I found myself shouting at the telly for were when Hulkenberg had his crash, do you remember? And he ended up upside down and he was shouting on the radio. Do you remember the car was on fire? Get me out of here. Um, you know, they do things like put in utterly fake extended pauses to build up the drama of those situations. So when he crashed, uh, Mark Slade, the engineer, came on the radio going, Nico, are you okay? And then there's a huge pause of like 10 seconds and the music builds up, to, you know, is he okay? Is he going to be all right? You know, is he going to respond to this radio message? Well, in reality, we all know that he responded immediately and it was absolutely fine. Um, so that felt fake and over the top to me, but uh, I'm not going to criticize the series too much because I think they've done a brilliant thing. It's put Formula One in front of millions of eyeballs that would have never, never normally perhaps come across F1. And as I said the other day, for lots of those people, 
they will now find a way to tune into Formula One and follow the story continuing through 2019. So massive success. Congratulations to everybody who was involved in making it. Uh, well done. I look forward to Series 2, which is uh, already being commissioned, is already underway for, the, for 2019. Uh, right, I need this second coffee of the day to jumpstart my day. Um, the other thing I just want to quickly finish on with a Netflix thing is that I think most people are aware that the top two teams, Ferrari and Mercedes, weren't involved in the making of this series. Does that detract from it? Does it ruin it? It does, definitely doesn't ruin it. Uh, it would have been great to see behind the scenes of this big, at times really fascinating championship battle of 2018 play out from inside each of those teams. That would have been great to see. It really would have added to the series. So in that sense, it's a shame. But on the flip side of that, because they weren't involved, we were actually able to focus a lot more on some of the smaller teams that maybe normally we would never get to see behind the scenes of in any Formula One coverage. So in that sense, that was quite a nice thing. Uh, I do hope they reconsider for, for the second series, uh, which is underway now, because it would be great to see, you know, behind the scene, I mean, I know what it's like. I've been involved in these things. I know it's fascinating. I know the dynamics that are involved in inside a team, the politics, uh, the managing your two drivers when there's a championship battle at stake is fascinating. So if we can get some insight into that, uh, I think it'll be brilliant. So I hope they, they take part in the second version, the second series. Uh, but I definitely think, think overall, if you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend it. Go and watch it. If you have access to Netflix or you can get access to Netflix, go and do it because it's, it's well worth it. You won't be disappointed is my overall take on the thing. Right, the other thing I just want to talk about today is the fact that on Tuesday next week uh, there is a big meeting in Formula One terms. It's a meeting of the F1 Strategy Group and the F1 Commission which will be heavily debating and voting upon uh, some of the decisions that will affect Formula One in 2021. 2021 is this big number, this big year that we've been talking about for what seems like forever, about the massive changes, how the, the future of our sport is going to be you know, completely in the hands of those people deciding what 2021 will look like. Well, all we've had so far is talk. We've seen some kind of uh, concept, liver, uh, concept cars, haven't we? We saw from Ross Braun, but they're just concepts. You know, whether the actual car will look anything like that, who knows? You know what concepts are like. We hardly ever see a concept ending up looking like the eventual car that, that goes to manufacture. So I really want to see, and I know all of you, I'm sure, want to see what 2021 is actually going to appear like to us. And this meeting next week is going to have, go some way to helping that. And it's not just about the way the cars look. It's not just about the technical regs. It's all the sporting regs. It's much more even, perhaps, much more urgent that we sort out the financial playing field, the cost cap, uh, you know, the business side for the teams and manufacturers. Are we going to be able to entice new people into our sport? Are the existing people in our sport going to see it as financially uh, beneficial to them to continue beyond 2021? Lots of these teams like Mercedes, Ferrari, they've all got to answer to the board of directors and convince that board that Formula One is a great place to spend hundreds of millions of dollars. Can't do that until we know what 2021 is going to look like. Now, if you remember, uh, and I've got it in front of me here, I'll pop it up on the screen. Uh, Liberty came into this sport and they came in with a bit of a bang. They talked about 2021 as being their big chance to stamp their mark on the sport. And they issued this press release on the 6th of April uh, last year. So almost a year ago, talking about what their plans were or their vision for 2021. And a couple of things I want to point out from it. It talks about, you know, bringing costs down to a more manageable level levelling out the playing field in, in terms of finance to some extent. It talks about keeping the cars as highly technical. Um, it says that the power unit rules must be attractive for new entrants and customer teams must have access to equivalent performance. So are we going to be able to attract new power unit manufacturers into the sport? So far it seems not because what Liberty originally set out with these big ideas to achieve it's now become clear that the big teams, the big manufacturers in Formula One currently, have so much more power over this side of things than the Liberty first appreciated, I think. And actually the Mercedes and the Ferraris of this world have stamped their mark on this discussion and what they want to see coming out of this rule set for 2021, what they want the power unit to be like. And actually, it's going to be very similar to what we have now, uh, which is fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with the current power units. They kind of work. They're very technologically advanced. They're brilliant pieces of engineering. And if we keep them somewhat level, somewhat similar in terms of 
development, we will start to get a closing up of the field. We're already seeing it. So in that sense, I'm not too worried. But is it going to attract new customers, new uh, entrants in terms of power unit supplies into this sport? Probably not. We've already seen some manufacturers disappear after, an er after early interest because of those rules looking now to, to stick more towards where, where the current rule set uh, lies. So that's one thing. The other thing that I, I just picked out from this press release that I think is almost impossible for them to achieve, and I don't see how they can do it, um, they have said, right, engineering technology must remain a cornerstone, but driver's skill must be the predominant factor in the performance of the car. How do you achieve that? How can you possibly achieve that? How can the driver be the predominant factor when you've got a variety of different cars with different power units that all have strengths and weaknesses. That's simply, unless, in my mind anyway, let me know what you think, unless you have a one-make championship where everyone's driving the same car, how can possibly the driver's skill predominantly be uh, the, the biggest predominant factor in the performance of the car? It can't. You can't achieve that. So that's a real shame because I, I know we'd love to see it, but we don't really want a one-make championship either, do we? So we've got that in, in F2 and, and F3, and etc. So that's one thing that I think they're going to struggle to try and match up to. Uh, the other thing is that they have said um, the new revenue distribution criteria must be more balanced based on meritocracy of the current performance and reward success for the teams and the commercial rights holder. Fair enough. You do well, you get rewarded for it. That's fine. But it also drops in a little line that says F1's unique historical franchise and value must still be recognised. And that, to me, points to the fact that um, they are still going to allow the likes of Ferrari, who are the biggest uh, players in history, I guess, the most successful players in history of this sport, to command more uh, from the pot. Uh, and I guess whether you agree or disagree with that, and again, let me know, um, that will be something that a little line that they'll be able to fall back on when we're talking about revenue distribution and the smaller teams, the likes of Williams and Haas, etc., are looking to get a bigger share of the pot, are the bigger teams going to be willing to give that up? Are Ferrari willing to give up their huge sums of money just for turning up on race day uh, to, to allow the smaller teams to have a bigger share? My guess is probably not. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. And then finally, the other thing that's going to be discussed on Tuesday is this idea of standardising some components and yet forcing teams to manufacture others. We've got Haas, who are in this sport with a completely different business model to everybody else. And at the moment, of course, as you know, they buy huge parts, huge number of parts, everything that's on the list that they're allowed to buy from uh, within the rules, they will take from Ferrari. So that's pretty much a whole rear end, including gearbox, suspension, pickups and, compo and suspension itself. The new rules, one of the things that I know is happening behind the scenes is that I talked about the standardised gearbox of 2021, which on the face of it looks like a, a good cost-saving measure. Uh, to me, I agree. I think it is a good cost-saving measure. I think it makes sense. Um, but part of the wording I understand from that rule set is that although there'll be a standardised gearbox, the teams will now have to manufacture their own suspension pickup points and therefore suspension. And that will mean that the B teams, if you want to call them that, the likes of Haas, are no longer able to just buy a whole rear end from their parent team. Liberty have concerns in their mind about the way the B team structure is bubbling under the surface within Formula 1 and how much power it gives to those parent teams. And on that note, I kind of agree with them. And not only because it means that the teams will have, uh, you, know, you know, the smaller teams will have to be subservient to their bigger teams when it comes to maybe driver lineups, uh, but also when it comes to things like strategy during a Grand Prix, could it start playing a part in strategy when the smaller team has to sort of toe the line with the bigger team, for example? And then even more than that, and this is a thing that Liberty have more concerns about, is that the power that that gives to the two or three big teams when they are supplying half the grid, half the grid with major components in terms of voting rights at things like next week's meeting. If Liberty think that too much power in that rule structure and that governance structure is going to the bigger teams, they will want to step in and that is exactly what they're doing. So next Tuesday's meeting is going to be fascinating to see what happens. Uh, I'm not sure we'll get a full uh, understanding of it immediately after Tuesday, but I'm sure the details will start to leak out. And I think it's a crucial point because 2021 may seem like a long way away, a bit like the deadline for my book, <laughs> but it will come round very, very rapidly. And teams, particularly on a budgetary sense, 
need to know right now, or very, very soon, whether 2021 will become financially viable to them, uh, whether they want to be taking part in a sport that they don't yet know the future of or what it will look like. So really fascinated to see that. Again, let me know your thoughts. What would you like 2021 to look like? What are the biggest changes you'd like to see happen? Let me know. Uh, I've got a rather embarrassing situation now. I've got to go and take my car to the garage down the road, not for any major work, um, but just because the water needs topping up. I know that seems ridiculous, but I can't get the bonnet open. <laughs> the bonnet catch is broken and I've got no tools here to sort it out. So quite embarrassingly, as a fairly accomplished mechanic, I've got to take my car to the garage for them to open the bonnet. And they know me down there. They know what I do. And they always take the piss out of me whenever I bring it in for anything. <laughs> so I'm braced for more of that. So wish me luck. Anyway, have a good day, folks. I'll speak to you tomorrow.